Mm -hmm. Okie dokie. Alrighty, let us get started. Fantastic, people are still coming in. Welcome. And okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. I feel like many people are still coming in, but majority are still here. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Blaze Elliott, and I am a PhD candidate in the Brain, Behavior, and Cognition program, as well as the Communications Chair for the Black Graduate Student Association here at Northwestern University. And on behalf of the Black Graduate Student Association, aka BGSA, in collaboration with the Graduate School of Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we would like to welcome you all to our Black History Month virtual speaking event, Legacy Unveiled, tracing the Black journey at Northwestern University through the lens of the 1968 Bursar's Office Takeover. Facilitated by the one and only Charla Rilson, the curator for the Black experience at Northwestern University Libraries. And even though we're gathered in a virtual setting, it is important that we acknowledge that our institutional campuses in Evanston and in Chicago sit on Native land. These areas are the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, including the Old Jibre, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa. And so for today, Northwestern's archivist and curator, Charla Rilson, she will illuminate the transformative history of the Bursar's office takeover and chronicle the resilience and triumphs of Northwestern's Black community. So please don't miss this opportunity to delve into the vibrant narrative of the Black experience here at Northwestern University. So now a little bit about our speaker. So Charla Rilson is the curator for the Black experience at Northwestern University Libraries, a position she began in 2017. She partners with community members to collect, preserve, and make accessible archival collections and oral histories that tell the history of Northwestern's Black student life, faculty, staff, and alums. To promote the use of these collections, Wilson creates research guides, curates digital and physical exhibits, develops audio tours, and gives presentations. She provides research consultations with researchers, students, and faculty who are interested in using these collections. Wilson has a bachelor's in American studies from Scripps College, as well as master's degrees in education from the Claremont Graduate University, history from California State University in San Marcos, and library and information science from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So we are so happy to have Charlotte with, his, with us today. So uh, approximately 15 minutes um, toward the end of the session will be reserved for Q&A, question and answer. And the Q&A box will be open so be sure to submit your questions. And um, just a reminder, as we mold our questions, I warmly invite us um, to ponder about how we can use um, this upcoming information to create a sense of empowerment, a sense of community, and a sense of curiosity to further illuminate our experience in the Black and the African diaspora community here at Northwestern University. And as a side, if the virtual space needs to be closed earlier than anticipated for any reason, we will be sure to follow up with any of the attendees. And so that's it for me. So without further ado, we bring Charla Wilson to our virtual stage. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Blaze. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Blaze said, my name is Charla Wilson, and I'm the curator for the Black Experience at Northwestern University Libraries. And I want to thank the Black Student, the Black Graduate Student Association, and the Graduate um, School's Office of Diversity and Inclusion for inviting me. Um, and it's really it's such a pleasure to be here with you all um, to talk about the history of the Bursar's Office takeover.
All right, so we are going to begin in what is likely an unusual place to start, and that is by going to Broadway. Um, I don't know about you, but I am a huge fan of the musical Hamilton. And one of my favorite songs is the final number titled, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the play, there is a spoiler alert. Alexander Hamilton dies at the end. Um, but that's okay. They actually reveal this in the opening act if you are not familiar with the duel between him and Aaron Burr. But in this song, Hamilton's loved ones and foes discuss how founding fathers like Hamilton and founding mothers might be remembered by folks like us today. And they do so by asking a set of questions. And there's one line that I want to point us to. It says, but when you're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who tells your story? So Hamilton's widow, Eliza Schuyler Hamilton, responded to this set of questions as a call to action. She devoted the rest of her life to collecting and preserving Hamilton's writings and interviewing his colleagues, essentially keeping his legacy alive. As an archivist, I love that Eliza had the foresight to hold on to Hamilton's documents so that those of us in the future would have the benefit of learning about him and the founding of this nation. Another person who was fully aware of the importance of keeping history alive was none other than the father of Black History Month, Carter G. Woodson. As many of you probably know, Chicago has ties to the origins of Black History Month. In 1915, Woodson and others organized a meeting on the South Side, which ultimately led to the founding of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which we today call ASALA. As part of their mission, they promoted the neglected and overlooked accomplishments of Black people. And in 1926, the organization launched Negro History Week. The following year, Black students at the Washington Intercollegiate Club of Chicago built upon the mission of celebrating and educating people on the accomplishments of Black life in a publication called The Negro in Chicago. It was often referred to as a wonder book as it provided a detailed account of a who's who in Chicago, um, as well as summaries and histories about Chicago's places of worship, schools, social clubs, businesses, as well as biographies and local about local and national Black leaders. The president of the organization was Frederick H. Hamarubi, who was not only from Chicago, but was also a graduate of Northwestern's law school in 1927. By the 1960s, he was a proponent of celebrating Black history beyond a week in Chicago, contributing to popularizing the month-long celebration. By the late 1960s, Black students on college campuses throughout the country, including students at Northwestern, demanded for Black studies courses to be added to the curriculum. They too became increasingly aware of the importance of knowing about African-American history, as well as its ties to Africa. So as I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you all, I was reminded that this year marks the 50th reunion of the class of 1974. And you might be asking, well, why is that significant? Well, I would argue that the year 1970, when this class arrived on campus as first years, marks a new era of Black student life at Northwestern. They also offer a unique perspective on the legacy of the Bursar's office takeover. And I want to share a few notable characteristics about this class that are worth mentioning. One could argue that this was the first incoming class to benefit from the agreement that was reached after the takeover. Also, this class played a pivotal role in implementing a significant portion of the resolutions that came about after the protest. And unlike classes that followed, the class of 1974 overlapped with students who participated in the takeover many of whom were mentors or acted as big brothers and sisters. And finally, they recognized the importance of honoring the legacy of the 68 protest. And one of the ways they did that was by starting a tradition called the ritual. So the ritual was first celebrated in 1970 and was created by alumna Eileen Cherry to welcome incoming Black students to Northwestern. It is a tradition that remains today, although it has looked different over the years. However, an important aspect of the program has always been passing down the history of the Bursar's office takeover to incoming students. So now more than ever, it is crucial that we learn about the fullness of history, 
especially as it pertains to American history, the good, the bad, the ugly. So in the spirit of Woodson, Hammurabi, and the class of 1974, I too want to pass along some history and talk about the legacy of the Bursar's office takeover. So I'll provide an overview of the protests, as well as a few earlier examples of Black student activism. And I'll talk about how the class of 74 responded to the legacy of the takeover by carrying the torch of further implementing the resolution. So I do have to warn you, this will not be comprehensive by any means. It'll just be a starting point, but I hope that it will inspire you to learn more. So let's get started. We'll start with the takeover. So in 1966, Northwestern admitted 54 Black students, its largest class and most diverse with a balance between men and women, and a change from the traditional male student athlete. Northwestern recruited many of these students through the summer academic program called the Northwestern University Chicago Action Project, also known as NUCAP. So this program was created in response to changing civil rights legislation, and particularly the Higher Education Act of 1965, which encouraged universities to diversify their campuses. So by 1967, about 120 Black students were enrolled at Northwestern, and that was out of a total enrollment of 6,000 undergraduate students. But these students, especially the ones who came to Northwestern through the NUCAP program, experienced some very difficult um, obstacles. And some of them included experiencing racial intimidation and harassment, especially from fraternity members who at times dressed in blackface or threw beer cans or water balloons or yelled racial epithets. Some Black students also received condescending remarks from peers who suggested that they were only admitted to Northwestern to diversify the campus, not on account of their academic merit. Black students who were also not allowed to request to live with another Black roommate. Rather, the logic was to encourage integration. And finally, Black students did not see Black history and culture reflected in the curriculum. So they confided in each other and realized they were not alone in these experiences. And students formed a group called For Members Only, or FMO, in 1967 as a way of building community, planning social gatherings, and finding ways of working through some of these challenges together. They were also shaped by social and political issues at the time, including the civil rights movement, the Black, the Black Power movement, Pan-Africanism, the Vietnam War, the student movement. So ultimately, this organization, originally intended to be a social group, adopted a political mission. Around the same time, another Black student group formed called the Afro-American Student Union, or AASU, which was mainly comprised of graduate students who were involved in local civil rights activities. Ultimately, both organizations would join forces. So on April 22nd, 1968, FMO and AASU submitted a list of demands to the administration with the opening statement. We, the Black students at Northwestern University, have found the academic, cultural, and social conditions for us on campus deplorably limited. In order to counteract the physical, emotional, spiritual purpose of our being here, we demand that the following conditions be immediately met. And some of the demands included and statement from the administration acknowledging the existence of institutional racism, increasing the enrollment of Black students, providing more financial aid, designating a corridor in the dormitories for Black students, allowing Black students to choose their own roommates, offering a Black studies course, and hiring Black faculty as well as a Black counselor, establishing a Black student union, and advocating for open housing in Evanston. So when students did not see these demands met, on May 3rd, 1968, they organized a takeover of the Bursar's office, which is the business office on campus. It's important to note that this was not a decision they made in haste or took lightly. They were aware of the potential consequences such as revoked admission, loss of scholarships, or police retaliation. But these students felt they had no other choice. So this protest lasted 38 hours and ended after an eight hour meeting between student representatives and administrators. 
And the result was a written resolution, which some of us refer to as the May 4th Agreement, in which administrators agreed to most of those student demands. So students' activism would also contribute to a lasting change at Northwestern, including ushering in initiatives towards diversity and inclusion, as well as establishing the Black House and the Department of Black Studies. This protest also taught Black students about the power of collective action. So as you might know, Black history at Northwestern did not begin in the 1960s. So you might be wondering, what was Black student life like before 1968? Uh, that might provide some context for their demands. And then what were some earlier examples of student activism? And if so, how successful were they? So at the archives, we often receive the question, who was the first Black student to graduate from a given department or school on campus? And answering that question and any similar ones regarding race in the 19th and early 20th centuries are often challenging for us to answer or confirm. And that is because the federal government did not require institutions of higher education to report statistical data along the lines of race like we do today. However, we do believe that John Jacob Astor Good was likely the first Black student to enroll as an undergrad at Northwestern in 1880. He was from Evanston and attended Evanston Township High School. And while he only spent three years at Northwestern to study classics, he did not graduate. Instead, he transferred to Howard University in HBCU. And as a side note, he was also the son-in-law to singer-actor Paul Robeson. Lawyer Taylor was likely the first Black student to get an undergraduate degree from Northwestern in 1903. He was from Kentucky, where he was a first grade teacher, and he enrolled at Northwestern in 1899 at the age of 34. Following graduation, he became a math and astronomy professor at Clark Atlanta University, another HBCU. And while he was at Northwestern, he participated in class leadership and the Rogers Debate Club. Naomi Willie Pollard was likely the first Black undergraduate woman to get her degree from Northwestern in 1905. She enrolled in 1901 with the hopes of becoming a teacher after graduation. As a side note, her family was one of the first Black families to live in Rogers Park as they migrated there from the South. Additionally, Harrison Farrell was likely the first Black person to get a PhD from Northwestern in 1928, which he received in German. He was also a violinist and founded an orchestra in Chicago. And finally, Emma Ann Reynolds is believed to be the first Black woman to receive a medical degree from Northwestern in 1895. Before pursuing a career in medicine, she worked as a teacher in a Black community where she witnessed firsthand their healthcare needs. She was also influential in encouraging Daniel Hale Williams, a Northwestern alumnus and cardiologist credited with performing the first successful open heart surgery to offer medical training for Black nurses at Provident Hospital in Chicago a healthcare facility he founded for African-Americans. So W.E.B. Du Bois surveyed 2,500 Black college graduates in the early 1900s, including five from Northwestern. And Du Bois discovered that Black students at this time were typically self-supporting, older, economically disadvantaged, as they were just a few decades removed from slavery. And they typically were pursuing education as a means for upward mobility. And they also tended to form their own associations and participate in social activities in their home communities rather than on campus. And many of them also commuted to their institutions. Du Bois continued this research over the years and he even corresponded with Edwin B. Jordan Jr. to get updated statistics on black student enrollment at Northwestern. And by the way, Jordan is also um, Northwest, sorry, Evanston's first black alderman and a Northwestern alumnus. So Northwestern did not have a written official policy of segregation. It did not deny African-Americans from enrolling, but still there were very few black students. And on average, five to 20 attended in a given academic year. And there were examples of barriers and exclusion. So I'm going to walk us through a few examples through the lens of housing discrimination, which was a major, major barrier for students at this time. So we know that there were a few Black students who lived on campus, including Lawyer Taylor, for a brief period of time. 
However, most students, most Black students had to find housing accommodations off campus. Some commuted from Chicago or lived with families in Evanston or at the Emerson Street YMCA. Still renting an apartment in Evanston presented a challenge due to restrictive housing covenants. But there is an early example of exclusion through the story of Isabella Ellis. So Ellis enrolled at Northwestern in 1902. We know that she was fair skinned and came from a wealthy family in San Antonio, Texas. But the housing administrators were not aware that she was black before her arrival. And the story goes that she was assigned to live with a white roommate in Chapin Hall. And unfortunately, this roommate refused to live with Ellis due to the color of her skin and was reassigned. Despite limited housing that year, the Women's Educational Aid Association, which oversaw Chapin Hall, allowed Ellis to live in a double, even though roommates were required. So Ellis waited for approval for housing for the following academic year. However, things got complicated when 12 white occupants of the dorm threatened to withdraw from the university if it meant they had to live with Ellis. Again, there was a housing shortage and students needed roommates. So the Women's Educational Aid Association discussed the situation at one of their meetings and voted against granting Ellis her housing request. And we actually have um, a copy of the minutes, as you can see here, and I'll just read an excerpt. It says, the question of the return of Miss Isabella Ellis colored to Chapin Hall was discussed in all its bearings, and it finally came to a vote, oops, sorry, um, vote on the following motion. As Miss Ellis had the use of a double room for one year, she was asked to make arrangements for the coming year. So after this decision, Ellis withdrew from the university and the story gained national attention, especially in the black press. While some of the members of the Northwestern faculty and the Women's Educational Aid Association opposed the decision, it remained unchanged. And the decision also set a precedent for denying black students housing on campus. So what's interesting about Naomi Willie Pollard is that her family lived in Rogers Park. So it's possible that because she could commute to campus, she was able to complete her studies, therefore allowing her to become the first undergraduate black woman to get a degree from Northwestern. So housing continued to be an issue and focus of student activism. We see a larger increase in black student enrollment on campus by the 1920s. In 1926, the Quibblers Club was founded as an integrated group for students who commuted to campus. They ultimately became a Black student organization that organized social gatherings, lectures, and even sponsored Negro History Week. In the 1940s, this social group shifted its mission to focus on political issues, namely calling for campus housing without racial restrictions. A key spokesperson for this group was Bill Branch a noted student debater, and later a candidate for student body president. He was quoted numerously in the Daily Northwestern advocating for open housing without racial restrictions. In 1946, the Daily Northwestern even posted a survey to see what students thought about the issue of open housing. And they found that 72% of students were opposed to integrated on-campus housing. However, 67 were in favor of international houses. So an international house is a dorm set aside for international students. As an alternative to open housing without racial restrictions, they allowed black students to live there as well. While this gave black students an option for on-campus housing, it still wasn't the integrated housing quibblers advocated for. And we can see here, so this is the International House for Women, which was established for 1947. You can see some of the people who lived there. And Asbury Hall was an international house for men, which opened in 1950. By 1953, there were open dorm policies that allowed black students to live in any of the campus dormitories. Still, this was not the end to the housing situation. While there was campus housing without racial restrictions by the 1960s, it was still very common, especially for black women to experience being assigned a white roommate who did not want to live with them on account of their race. And as a result, that student would usually be reassigned. And finally, renting an apartment in Evanston was challenging too. 
Joseph Akpaku was an international student from Nigeria, and he experienced landlords refusing to rent to him. And here's a quote of him describing what that experience was like. He said, I'm afraid many people do not and cannot know what it is like to spend three weeks running around Evanston, making over 100 telephone calls in search of a room and all to no avail. So he ultimately found housing 10 blocks from campus in what was referred to at that time as the Negro District in Evanston. Still, Akpaku wanted to make a difference and he ran for ASG vice president on a 14 point plan, which included advocating for open housing in Evanston. And in 1965, he became the first black vice president elected to ASG. So you can see that black students faced um, Prior to the takeover, sorry, you can see some of the challenges that Black students face prior to the takeover with a key issue being housing. And you might imagine the difficulty of organizing before 19, the 1960s when Black students were few in number. Again, the students during the takeover experienced firsthand the power of collective action in leading to change. And so while the protest in 1968 ended successfully with the May 4th Agreement, work still needed to be done to implement it. So alums from the 1970s, 1974, um, often referred to this era not as a time of protest, but of negotiation. The class of 1974 would harness their collective action towards accountability. So FMO reorganized its leadership structure and created committees that were responsible for overseeing various areas, including housing, admissions, African-American studies, and cultural programming. One of the areas where students were instrumental was in continuing to advocate for an increase in Black student enrollment. As a result of the takeover in September of 1969, the university hired Garrison Hedrick and as an admissions director who was responsible for diversifying the student body. In fact, he was able to devote 20% of his time to recruiting Black students. While Hedrick served briefly, we do see a gradual increase in Black student enrollment, reaching 180 students by 1971. Beginning in 1970, Walter Clark served as the admissions director and played a crucial role in diversifying the student body in the 1970s. He worked with FMO Student Admissions Committee and took them along with other recruiters to visit high schools and meet with prospective students. These visits had a positive impact on prospective Black students who expressed appreciation for the opportunity of hearing firsthand what it was like to be a Black student at Northwestern. Moreover, the Student Admissions Committee also reviewed applications and provided recommendations. And due to these efforts, by 1973, Northwestern enrolled 670 Black students, representing 10% of the undergraduate student body, which was the largest to that date. So due to the increased enrollment of Black students, Black students also began advocating for a larger Black house. So here is a photograph of the original space, which is at 619 Emerson Street. Um, it was This is where they had the Black House until January of 1973, but they were able to secure a new space that was just catty corner from that location at 1914 Sheridan Road, which is the current location of the Black House. So these students began to enjoy having access to the Black House, and they even had support staff, including a dedicated dean. And the staff provided academic support, counseling, and culturally relevant programming. We also began to see the formation of several Black student organizations, and also increases in Greek pledging and the creation of student publications. So I mentioned earlier that Eileen Cherry introduced the tradition of the ritual. Well, Cherry also assumed a new FMO role as a facilitator of cultural affairs. So she was inspired by the Black arts movement and encouraged her peers to create artistic outlets that promoted Black consciousness and fostered self-expression. So she would help some of her peers start some groups on campus, including Black Folks Theater, FMO's jazz ensemble called The Life and Death Situation, a dance troupe called Bantu Wazuri, a visual arts group, and the Northwestern Community Ensemble, which is today known as the Gospel Choir. And then finally, students were instrumental in working with administrators to include Black history in the curriculum. 
It was not until May of 1970 that the Board of Trustees approved the establishment of the Department of African American Studies. And students were adamant about advocating for a department over a program. They believed that this would help it to attract the best faculty, provide them with autonomy, and ensure funding and resources. However, there were disagreements about the level of student involvement in the decision-making process, particularly when it came to hiring. In fact, there was a controversial event that occurred when the student's choice for department chair, Lerone Bennett, who was the editor of Ebony Magazine, left after he felt pushed out by two faculty members. So the students even boycotted the department for several months. However, they ultimately reconciled and began supporting the department. Overall, the students of the class of 74 were instrumental in carrying out the vision that students from the takeover had. So Northwestern has a rich history of student activism, and some have found inspiration in the past, including from the history of the Bursar's office takeover. They at times use it to measure progress, advocate for new initiatives, or to hold the institution accountable. For instance, there was a hunger strike in support of Asian American studies, a petition for Latinx studies, and efforts to prioritize the retention and recruitment of Black faculty and students, all of which students referenced the history of the takeover. There's one more student protest that referenced the takeover that I want to mention that actually contributed to the founding of my position. So in 2015, a student group called the Concerned Students of Northwestern University presented a list of demands to the administration addressing changes they wanted to see take place on campus to improve their student experiences, especially the critical needs for Black students. And the catalyst for that was students were protesting a decision to consolidate the Black House and the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs. The concern was that merging the spaces would no longer make the Black House a safe space exclusively for Black students, which was the original intention. And they were concerned that changing access to who had, changing who had access to that space was also an erasure of the legacy of the Bursar's office takeover. So the 2015 protests led to important conversations and action steps. And one of the outcomes was renovating the Black House and further investing in this much needed resource for Black students. Another result, although separate from student demands, was that the protest prompted leaders of the Black Alumni Association, NUBA, to advocate for a position dedicated to preserving historical documents about Black history at Northwestern and educating our community about Black history at this institution. So this led to a collaboration of NUBA, the University Libraries, and the Office of the Provost in establishing the position of Archivist for the Black Experience. And so I commend these leaders for coming together during what had to be a very tense moment in our university's history and for recognizing a blind spot and creating an opportunity for our community to engage in learning about our campus's past. So at the beginning of the talk, I asked, when you're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who tells your story? So a key theme in the musical Hamilton is legacy and understanding that one does not have control over how they will be remembered. They have to rely on others, on us, to keep their memory alive. So I'm so glad that you all showed interest in learning about the history and the legacy of the Bursar's office takeover. So let's continue learning about the past. And I do want to end by saying that the University Archives is a resource for you. We are located on the Evanston campus in Deering Library, and our mission is to preserve records that document every aspect of Northwestern's history, whether that is student activism, Black student life. Um, in fact, student activism is one of our most frequently requested topics by researchers. Um, but we also have collections about the lives uh, and careers of Northwestern alums and faculty, as well as student organization records. That includes um, also photographs, university publications, student publications, yearbooks, and much more. So do know that you have friends in the archives who are happy to connect you to those resources. And lastly, I do want to plug something. Um, I know you all will have amazing features ahead of you. So please know that we would love to partner with you in preserving your papers someday. 
So just think of us as your Eliza Schuyler Hamilton. So don't throw away your stuff, call us first. And similarly, if um, you're part of a student organization, we have an initiative called Make Your Mark, Preserving Your Legacy for Future Wildcats. So my colleagues and I support student organization leaders in preserving their org's records at the archives for long-term preservation and access. So we provide some training and some individualized consultation. So please come and talk to us if you would like any support in that area. All right, and I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you, Charla. What a beautiful presentation. And thank you for the plug. Um, just a quick question. How accessible are these archives? Do um, people have to contact you first? Is there a section in the library that they can go to? Like, how does that work? No, that's a great question. So um, there are different ways that you can connect with us. We do have a website. So you can Google the McCormick Library of Special Collections and University Archives. And we have a um, different portals that you can use. We have a couple of search engines where you can look for, kind of browse through the collections that we have. And um, you can also contact us directly if you need some help navigating um, the collections that are available. Um, but also you're, you're free to stop by and visit us. We're on the third floor in Deering Library and we have some ready reference material. So if you're just interested in stopping by to see just a little bit about Northwestern's history. We have books and yearbooks um, that are available in that space and you do not have to book an appointment to look at that. Um, but if you wanna do some serious research and you want to get access to some of our larger collections, then we do ask that you book an appointment and, and we'll connect you to those, those collections. Thank you so very much. Speaking of gathering research, we have a beautiful question about oral history. And so can oh, okay. you speak more about your work in gathering oral history? Is there a framework uh, guiding this project? As there are many possible students or alums to be interviewed since oral history is one way to influence one's legacy. Absolutely. Um, I love the method of, of oral history. Um, so I started interviewing some alums in 2021 and um, it was around a, an, the 50th anniversary of the Northwestern Community Ensemble, the, the gospel choir mm -hmm. on campus. And it was just a really great opportunity to gather stories, um, experiences, perspectives on their student experience that we will not find in physical documentation. Mm -hmm. And so, so it was really um, wonderful to be able to speak with the founders and early leaders of the organization and, and document that history. Um, but I do have a larger, so I've expanded upon that project and I have a, it's called the Black Student Experience um, oh. Oral History Project. And yeah. um, we currently have two that are available. Um, so I can share the link um, to that if you're interested in, in checking that out. Um, but there are more on the way. I think I have 26 interviews that have been conducted so far. Um, so we're transcribing them and hopefully they'll be available very soon. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, we have another um, question and statement. Um, somebody said, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And you talk a lot about students and faculty. Um, what can you tell us about the history of Black staff at Northwestern? Sure, sure. Yes, the history of Black staff is so important to you. Um, you know, I, just thinking about um, the legacy of the takeover, you know, students advocated for a Black counselor and a dean, and there was support staff for, for students um, as a result of, of the takeover. Mm -hmm. And so um, I mentioned earlier, there's Paul Black, you probably saw him as the first dean, um, you know, he was instrumental in advocating for Black students, working with um, even administrators to help sort of mediate some situations and advocate for, you know, resources that Black students would need. And we have, there's a long history of, of support staff with Black students. And um, so, um, yeah, so, so that's certainly important. And then there's just, there's staff and just throughout the university. And that's not an area I have done a lot of research in. I've primarily been focused on the student experience. Um, but I mean, we 
I mean, students receive that support from staff and that that is such an important part of um, the history here at Northwestern. So um, yeah, but yeah, I, I think there's some resources we have in, in the library that I can connect you to if you wanted to learn a little bit more about a specific kind of, of staff member. Um, I'm happy to connect you with some resources. Thank you, thank you. We do have also like several statements about um, students being excited to hear about how this legacy feeds from a past struggle for liberation around Evanston and also the future of the movement. Um, and so speaking of also legacy, we talked about the Black student um, undergraduate experience. We talked about Black staff, um, but what about alumni? So what do the alumni who um, participated in the office takeover find to be the biggest impact in the Black Northwestern experience? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think everyone's probably going to have a different opinion about what they think the biggest impact was. Um, I think overall, they would probably say, um, you know, paving the way to ensure that Black students of today have a much better student experience than they did. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that brings to mind just thinking of oral histories. I had a chance to interview um, three alums mm -hmm. a couple of months ago about their student experience in the early 1960s. So this was before that new cap um, group came to Northwestern. And um, they actually gave themselves, these, these were three women, they gave themselves the nickname Just Us Three. And the story behind that is when they arrived on campus, they were able to find each other and they learned that they were the only Black women undergraduates on campus at that time. So hence the name, Just Us Three. <laughs> it was just three of them. And um, so this alum shared that um, because she graduated, I think, two years before the takeover, she really struggled with you know, the student experience at Northwestern. She often felt very isolated and lonely on campus. Um, and in some ways, in some ways regretted, you know, coming to the institution because she didn't have, you know, like the same student experience that some of her peers did at an HBCU. Um, mm -hmm. But she stayed in contact with students who were still on campus and were also involved in the takeover. And mm -hmm. they shared with her, they just said, you know, wow, we really wish you were here now, you know, while there was more Black students on campus, it was a much different um, experience. And they thought that she would have done much better and felt much more better about her student experience at Northwestern, you know, had she been there at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think in bringing up that example, um, I, I think, you know, by students during the takeover doing what they did, you know, they allowed for students to come after them to have a better student experience um, where, you know, perhaps, you know, because there are more in number, you know, they're not as isolated um, as just those three, right? <laughs> and so, um, so I, I think, you know, they'll all have different, I'm certain they'll all have different perspectives, but I, I would hope that, you know, they're, they would probably say, you know, improving um, the experiences of those who came after them. Yes, thank you for that. And it seems like many of these experiences are focused upon having a sense of community. I hear loneliness. Right. I hear like we're not. Right. There's only three of us. There's just us. Um, and it reminds me of something that you said earlier about housing, and that housing continued to be a problem in the Black student life experience, particularly like with roommates and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any sort of movement about establishing like a residential um, Black undergraduate experience here at Northwestern? And what's the history behind that? What do you mean for current students? Mm -hmm. I do not know. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's something that students are advocating for or if that's mm -hmm. something that is in the works that I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but in 68, I think Black students thought it was important to have a corridor for Black students exactly for that reason. You know, they, they didn't want to keep going through the experience of feeling rejected, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and they wanted an opportunity to build that community. And um, there is also 
Black students at that time are also experiencing some challenges about um, being in social areas such as, you know, like a living room within the dormitory. You know, right. they may gather in groups of three or four and their white peers would assume they're up to something or they would be bothered by the music they were playing. And so they didn't want to go through those kinds of situations. And so they felt that if they had a separate space that was just their own, you know, they could be free to be themselves and to, you know, enjoy the music they wanted to listen to, have the conversations they wanted to have without, you know, people, you know, perhaps making up rumors about them or yes. <laughs> the case may be. Thank you. That reminds me a lot of like um the Black House. Um yes. the, the, the the contribution to the Black House. Um, do you know if like the Black House may have contributed to any continued activism? I know you mentioned briefly something that happened back in 2015 at the Black House. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, the Black House, it's, it's such an important social space for Black students. It's a safe space mm -hmm. that they use for social gatherings. Um, it's usually the offices of FMO and other, you know, satellite organizations. And so that's that's a meeting space for mm -hmm. Black students. And um, and it has been used as, you know, a, a location where Black students have protested um, over the years, including the 2015 protest. Um, I also showed a photo of a protest from 1989. Um, mm -hmm. Students had a, a protest where they were um, it was a year when several Black faculty left the university at the same time. And so they had concerns about, you know, the retention of, of Black faculty and the importance of hiring more um, and, and supporting them. Um, and so that space has been used as a location to um, amplify the needs of, of Black students and, and the larger community on campus. Um, and there are other, I'm certain there are other examples too, um, of where that has been um, an important location for for sharing those needs. Thank you so very much. Um, you also mentioned earlier that the takeover sometimes is used as a reference point uh, to figure out like where we are today, um, how far that we have come and maybe how far we can go. And so in comparison to like enrollment back um, around 1969 to today. Well, where do you think that we stand today? Um, it can be numbers, like how many Black students overall, or maybe where they concentrated in schools or units, or anything else that you may have about the history of today's numbers or enrollment or where we stand today as a Black community in reference to um, where we were back in 1969. <laughs> yeah, and I think there has been... Um... I think Black students over the years have voiced, continued to advocate for increasing Black student enrollment. Um, so there certainly has been an area um, that has been voiced. Um, I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but I do know like we have archival materials that provides more of that statistical data. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's there have been um, you know some ups and some downs, and but I, I do I do see that there has been over the history since sixty eight a continued effort to continue advocating for the importance of ensuring that we have a diverse community and increased enrollment of Black students. Um, and so I would be happy to share that document with you. I just I, I don't have specific numbers <laughs> um, no. with me, but, but yes, absolutely. Um, I'm curious. What was, what do you think was the tipping point that allowed the Bursar uh, office takeover to take place at that particular time? Sure. Yeah, I think there were a few catalysts. Um, one, well, I, I think there's a number of things. So you have a larger student body of Black students, you know, there at one time. And so, you know, you know, having 120 Black students versus, you know, five in previous years, you know, just having a larger number makes it much more feasible to, mm -hmm. to speak out. 
and and advocate for themselves, but you also have the civil rights movement. So they're influenced by that kind of activism and they're engaged in the issues that are going on across the country and in their home communities. Um, But there are a couple of specific ones that alums would point out, including the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., which took place in in April, um, just a few weeks before they submitted their demands to the administration. That was sort of a a tipping point. Um, You know, students realized that, you know, this was someone who spoke about peace, yet he was brutally murdered. And, you know, they they felt a bit defeated and, um, and wanted to do something in response that, you know, that they felt that they could can make a difference in their own student experiences on campus. So the assassination of MLK was certainly one of them, um, but they were also experiencing some some challenges with Greek organizations on campus, particularly fraternity members who were harassing students. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a few violent um, encounters with Greek organizations leading, like there were two in particular leading up to the protest that concerned Black students um, because the response was penalizing the Black students, but not addressing sort of the the racism that that surrounded the issue. And so they were concerned about some of the yeah, the, re- the response to to how the administrators um, were not enforcing, um, or were not really like reprimanding the, the Greek organization uh, members, um, but they were quick to respond to um, the Black students in a, a much more aggressive way. And so they were concerned about, you know, some of the practices around that. Um, and so they were, they were saying we, we need to speak up in, in response to how they're being responded to um, and, and being treated. Wow, oh, thank you. This like opens up or even addresses a, another question that um, a student was asking um, because another takeover actually happened around that same time. It was uh, Cornell University. Um, and I was going to ask you um, if you think the Bursar takeover and the Rillard Straight Hall takeover at Cornell was related. Um, but I can see how like the political events and the a political mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. environment inspired both of those to happen you know, right. at the same time. Um, right. Yeah, I think, right. I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they were aware of what was going on at Northwestern and that that took place a year after the takeover. Um, so that's a certain really a possibility. Um, I do think what's something that's interesting about that too is that James Turner, who was the spokesperson for Black students during the takeover and was the president of the Afro-American Student Union, which co-led the protests, um, he was hired He was hired to um, be the director of Cornell's, um, I think it's the center for Africana studies, I think I have the title wrong, Um, but he became the first director of that new program at Cornell in 69. And so maybe there's a connection there um, Mm -hmm. where students were aware of his activism at Northwestern and perhaps that was influential in in his appointment at Cornell. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And we have about like five more minutes to go through some questions, but I'm gonna try to get them all in. But speaking of Greek life and the ways in which it impacted how students um, reacted to some of the administration and um, the way in which the administration maybe uh, dealt with discipline of the students versus the violence that they experienced with, with Greek life on campus. What about the impact of Black Greek life with the Bursar takeover? Like, was there any Black Greek life initiatives or um experiences or lingering effects at the takeover like what was that involvement like if you know yeah yeah and I'm just pulling up a note here so I can get a bit of a timeline um but yeah Greek life I mean that was really important again for students to form a sense of community on campus and um and that that allowed them to connect with a group that could also 
create a sense of a social life for Black students at that time. Um, because something that alums from the early 60s would, would share, early 60s and prior to that, was that there was a lack of a social life for Black students on campus. And um, at that time, the majority of the Northwestern student body um, used Greek organization as their, their social outlet. Um, but typically the predominantly white Greek orgs did not allow black students to pledge. So, so it was very difficult for black students to, to get into those, um, into to these organizations. So they, right, they would need to turn to their own <laughs> and to, their, to the black Greek organizations. Um, but I did want to pull up a, a couple of um, milestones, I, I guess. Um, so our the first Black Greek organization to be chartered at Northwestern was Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity in 1911. Mm -hmm. And um, just after that, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity was founded in 1922. Um, but they were, they existed at that period of time, but when inactive for several decades because Black student enrollment dropped. Um, and so unfortunately they were not available on campus, um, but when the students from the NUCAP program came to campus, there were more of them. And um, beginning in 1967, we start to see particularly students from the takeover. So some of the students who were involved in the takeover were also instrumental in re or, or, um, reactivating the Black Greek organizations, including the Kappas and the Alphas. Mm -hmm. And we also see, um, we see the, we see Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority also charter um, in 1969. So we start to see again, a sort of a Black Greek presence on campus in the sixties, thanks to those who were involved in the takeover. Um, but it's also interesting too, before the takeover, there were still some Black students involved in Greek organizations, but they were usually the Jewish Greek organizations. They were welcoming of, of Black students. And um, and then there were a couple of, we know of the first um, Black women to pledge in 1967. And they, were, they pledged to predominantly white sororities that were also more open to um, Black students joining. But, um, but yeah, I think overall, like, you know, that community aspect was really important, and um, and also to have something that affirms their culture and, and racial identity was also really important to them as well. That is very informative. Thank you so very much. Yeah, and we're going to squeeze in one last question today. Okay, uh, our attendees said thank you for this amazing presentation and your time. Uh, this made them think about the work of Shorefront Legacy Center and the documentation of Evanston's Black community, their achievements, activism, and civic engagement. And so understanding that your position takes on archiving the Black experience at Northwestern, is there any history about Black students' activism or civic engagement in the local Evanston community? Hmm. That's a great question. Um... That is, I think it's worth, and I have a feeling that's Larice, um, the director of Shorefront, who's asking that question. I think it would be great to look into that more closely. Um, I'd love to learn more about that. Um, what comes to mind, and so in terms of Black students, what actually what immediately comes to mind is, um, I remember speaking to an alum who, um, talked about building, so it isn't activism, but talking about building a bridge between Black students at Northwestern and some of the local, um, like elementary to high school Black students to do some mentorship. So I, I am aware of that, um, but examples of activism are not coming to mind at this moment, but I think it's certainly worth looking into. Beautiful, thank you so very much. And it seems as if we are at time, um, but this was so beautiful and so informative. And as I was listening to you, um, I had to put myself into the history and for me to kind of self-reflect, you know, this is about me as well. I am a graduate student yeah. in 
this does not separate me from everything that is going on. So thank you um, for your work. Thank you for your presence. And thank you for your time out to present uh, this to all of us uh, this afternoon. We truly appreciate it. Um, and hope, hopefully, you know, we all leave inspired because of you today. Um, so, and also for everyone else, thank you all for your attendance and thank you for your questions. This was beautiful. Thank you, Charla. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Always, always.